Survival rates in ovarian cancer have improved only slightly over four decades, but innovative clinical trials, such as those conducted at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, are identifying effective therapies. Progress is gradually gaining momentum in this deadly cancer. Ovarian cancer is very challenging because it's already a metastatic condition when we first see it. For the women who are diagnosed ultimately with ovarian cancer, the first symptoms are pelvic pressure, bloating, um, uh, inability to eat as much as they used to, um, abdominal distension. And when those symptoms are present, it's already reflecting a situation where the disease is spread into the abdominal cavity. So we're kind of already behind the ball to start. That's the major issue. And that's also the great promise for this disease is in that if we could find a way to either migrate the stage at diagnosis to an earlier stage or identify or prevent, we would make a huge benefit in this disease. This incidence is 22,000 cases a year. We've, that number has actually been relatively static. What has changed is the prevalence. So in the 70s, if the average expectation was a two-year survivorship, whereas now it's five years, what happens? What happens is that you continue to contribute patients to the pool who are not dying with the disease. So the prevalence is actually rising, and it's rising rapidly. And it's getting to the point now where prevalence is almost 10 times incidence. It's just uh, over 190,000 women um, have had this disease or are alive with this disease in this time point. This rare tumor for which women are surviving longer is becoming a, a bigger issue because there's more of these women around, and it's also an opportunity. A growing understanding of the pathobiology of ovarian cancer has opened new roads into detection and treatment of the disease. In probably a solid half of the cases, uh, we find that there's a nice, normal, to precancerous to cancerous alteration that happens in the fallopian tube. And that the signature, P53 signature that we see in the fallopian tube cells is what we'd expect to see in the ovary. And so that has actually brought on some new ideas. And so we're very hopeful that as we understand more about the pathobiology of the disease, even if we can't determine exactly what's, what's causing it to start, that maybe there are some preventative mechanisms that we can uh, get in front of. Chemotherapy remains the standard of care in ovarian cancer, but a growing number of new agents are poised to improve outcomes. Research cures cancer. I think that's the only way we're going to move the needle, and so we have dedicated um, our, uh, a portion of our department's work on establishing the new therapeutics that are going to hopefully replace what I call the big bat swing of uh, chemotherapy. But the novel therapies, including drugs like the immunotherapies, um, and some of these other targeted agents that show great promise in other diseases, they're only available through clinical trial. So for me, at every step when a decision is being made for treatment, I try to figure out whether or not there's a trial that a patient can participate on, because I think that's how we advance the science. And that's why we've tried to create all of these novel trial designs, the window of opportunity studies that we're so excited about, you know, basically putting these targeted agents up front before surgery. You know, if we see an impact, in just a short period of time, then can we extend that? Can we do a few months? Can we do six months? You know, can we really eliminate that chemotherapy up front? I mean, it's, it's exciting. With our biostatistics department, we've been interested in coming up with more versatile uh, trials such that, um, you know, you might start a trial with uh, three or four different arms, but uh, the same trial would have two or three replacement arms such that regimens that do very well or do very poorly would be selected out and replaced with predetermined uh, regimens uh, so that in a more rapid way you can test different combinations. One of the things that uh, are concepts that we really have to not lose sight of is what's the impact of all of this development on patients. Except for the fact that I have to um, go to MD Anderson on a regular basis for uh, to see my doctor and to get treatments. Uh, basically, I do everything I've ever done and, and then some. The way that treatment affects patients is incredibly important to understanding that it's a benefit. Oh, I love to skydive. It's 
second time I jumped, it was just uh, happened to be like a, a anniversary type thing of my chemo. I had taken a, a hundred months, a hundred cycles of the chemo. So it was a celebr celebratory thing too, to jump out of a plane. Even though we may see a physical benefit, if we don't see that the patient, that it's acceptable to patients or it doesn't make them feel better, it's not a benefit. As almost as important as this development of new drugs is actually coming up with very detailed ways that are relevant for in, in the eyes of the patient to measure the impact of treatment. I can't stress that enough. We have to understand that what we're doing is actually helping them. Hi, my name is Kelvin and I work on the team that creates the content that you've just seen, Medscape TV. If you like the content and want to see more, click on the button to the right and it'll take you to the full series.